much to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this. Um, if you know my history, I've um, been working in many, for many years on environmental chemical mixtures. Um, and more recently, I'm starting to thinking more and more about n nutrition, and that's what I'm going to sort of focus on um, today. So if you think about the exposome, it uh, provides a holistic view of human health and disease, uh, includes exposures from diets, lifestyles, and behaviors. But what I want to sort of disentangle is when you talk, when you talk about um, diets, you can think about the, some of the processed foods and things that are in the marketplace that really are just chemicals, not really food. Um, but we also have food that has nutrients in it, right? And there's got to be benefit to good nutrition. So the question is, I'm a metrics person, right? I want to build ways of measuring things. And so is there a way that we can actually have a very um, personalized um, me metric for good nutrition? And so that's what I'm going to demonstrate to you today or show you a little bit of what we've done in that, in that regard. Um, because it, it's, not, it's not just what you eat, but, but the... Um, nutritiousness of what you eat um, in terms of the calories that you have, right? So next to that, of course, to my mind, um, a holy grail is to link or to model together the, the concept of good nutrition, and then we have these environmental toxins that go on and on and on, right? So can we put those together in a model? Because what I'd really like to say at the end of the day is that we've got this ability to say the good public health message that we have is let's see how we can eat better to p potentially either mitigate, meaning change the association of the environmental chemicals, or at least just balance it out. So can we look at that and measure that in a way? So that's what I'm going to try to illustrate to you today is sort of that concept. Um, I don't have good publicly available data yet to show, so I'm going to show, I've got a, some simulation and then some other data that I'll show, but uh, we'll get there. Okay, so like I say, the research question that I'm after is, is there evidence of this mitigating effect of good nutrition on adverse effects of environmental chemicals? Okay, so... So what do we mean about eating healthy, right? So if you look towards the USDA guidelines, um, there are all kinds of guidelines about healthy eating. Five of them are listed here. So there's a lot of, if you think about the complexity of eating, right, we've got all these different kinds of foods. We've got different cultural um, habits of eating foods. Uh, we've got people with, who just choose to eat differently than others. So it's complicated if you start talking about um, um, food patterns, right? To my mind, though, the simplifying part is to take that into nutrients, because there are only so many, well, I mean, I guess there are a bunch of nutrients, but, you know, it, it's more of a new, uh, measurable, sort of countable uh, way of putting things together. So that's where, where, I'm, where I'd like to go. But as a comparison to that, I want you to think about there are multiple ways of putting together an index about, about nutrition. Something that's in the literature some is this healthy eating index, which I understand was created by the USDA and I think the National Cancer Institute. Largely it is a, a, a metric that measures how good Americans eat, right? Um, and it's based on 13 different components, nine of them in terms of adequacy. I don't know if you can read the green there, but largely food types, right? Um, and then some moderators um, like salt and sugar and things like that, bad fats. Um, but the good thing about the healthy eating index is it can actually be applied to um, the whole food stream. It can be applied to the, what's in the food supply chain. It can be applied to the menu in a fast food restaurant. And it can also be applied to an individual. But largely, it is a measure of the extent of how well Americans eat. Right? which is different than what I really want to get to. I really want to get to the question about what's right for me. So if you think about the concept of, of personalized nutrition, and then you look at Megan Horton here in the middle of the audience, and if you know her, she's a CrossFit trainer, okay? And Manish is no longer in the audience, I don't think. But if you look at Manish, I think Manish and Megan have very different nutritional needs, right? Not to... Don't tell me, Manish, I said that. But <laughs> the point is that nutrition has got to be linked to your lifestyle. If you're trying to bodybuild and if you're trying, you need a lot of protein. If you're not so interested in that, maybe you don't need that much protein. Maybe you have a medical condition where you can't eat 
high fat diets or you have, and in fact that's how I got into this back in the day was I was working with a pancreatitis doctor who was telling me his patients were eating jello because they knew if they ate wrong they were going to have these horrible painful crises, right? That can't be right. How can you just eat jello? That can't be right, right? I also used to know a guy who was on the Atkins diet and he lost a ton of weight. What did he eat for breakfast every day? A Diet Coke and a pound of bacon. Literally a pound of bacon every day. He lost a lot of weight because he wasn't eating carbohydrates, but how can that be good for you, right? So how do you look at then good nutrition? So if you look at the um, dietary guideline values, that's a, that's a good place to start. And these things are actually pretty subject specific. It has to do with your age, your height, your gender, your uh, medical conditions. Do you smoke? Um, do you drink? Are you pregnant? But then also things like lifestyle. You might choose to eat in a certain way because of the way you live your life. So there is no really one size fits all diet. Um, and that's what I want to go into. How do we get an, an index in that would then accommodate all of that? So we've developed this, um, my, I call it My Nutrition Index, it's not My Nutrition Index, it can be your nutrition index too. But it's, it's after that idea of a subject specific index. It's characterized based on how I want to eat, how you want to eat, so I call it My Nutrition Index. It's comprised of dozens of macronutrients and micronutrients. Um, and it's meant to be a measure of overall nutrition, overall, given the calories that you eat. So it's not, it's not, a, it's not just a calorie-based thing. It's given that you eat these many calories, how nutritious on that scale um, do you, um, is, is what you eat. So, for example, um, on the little table there is, um, I found a, a published version of what do we mean by a Mediterranean diet. So we think of Mediterranean diet as a good, a good diet. It's, you know, fruits and vegetables, seeds, and good olive oils and things like that. Um, but on my scale, the My Nutrition Index, if you uh, evaluate that for, you know, a man who's 25 years old and he's a big guy and he's very active, that looks like a pretty good diet to, or diet for him, a 90, uh, he got a score of a 94, right? But if you're a little petite woman who doesn't move much, maybe that's not such a good score for you, right? Okay, so how would you actually evaluate or calculate my nutrition index? It can be based on um, sources of, nutri of nutrients, wherever that comes from. It can come from um, dietary recall data, um, it can come from food frequency questionnaires, and it can come from dietary tracking apps if, you have the, if they give you the, the nutrients. Largely the basis of a lot of these diet studies, if you're not familiar with that, is there is this um, USDA's Food and Nutrient Database for Dietary Studies, the FNDDS, which links, I think it's over 100,000 different food types now, to nutrients, right? And so once you can, and that's how you can track your food or that's how these um, databases are calculated, is based on the link between the food and all of these, I think, more than 60 nutrients. Okay, so that's the My Nutrition Index. Now, the good thing for me is, as a biostatistician, is I want to use such an index in regression models. I want to be able to evaluate what, do I, what does it look like to have nutrition as a concept, as a, as a unidimensional construct, right, in a regression model compared to or in the same place with um, environmental chemicals. Now, what I have demonstrated there on the bottom, bottom right is the chemicals is a big mess, right? I mean, you could what are we going to talk about? Just a handful of the chemicals or more together? I don't have good um, untargeted data to show you today in terms of this sort of little um, case study that I have for you, um, but that's where I want to go. So eventually what we'd like to do is to do have a weighted index that, um, that identifies components on a broad set of, of chemicals um, that would be linked to some health effect, and that's this weighted quantile sum regression which we've developed but in the same model have this My Nutrition Index. So a little bit on weighted quantile sum regression. Um, so the idea is randomly split your data between a training and a validation data set. The first step is to estimate um, in, a, in a, it's called a nonlinear, a generalized nonlinear model because we've got weights and beta coefficients that we're, in, that we're estimating all simultaneously. Um, and then we adjust for covariate covariates as well, so the covariates are here, the weights and the beta associated with that. Now what we want to do is, because these chemicals are highly correlated, what we want to do is to create an index that has signal from, um, if you have correlated components, it may get a signal of an association to the outcome from 
multiple sort of components within that correlated set, right? So one way to do that is to have an ensemble step. One way to do that is to evaluate that model multiple times. So the, the first way we talked about weighted quantile sum regression was using a bootstrap step. And a bootstrap step says um, randomly select, if you have a sample size of 200, randomly select a sample of 200 from your data with replacement. So you could get repeated subjects, you know, in, the, in, the, in each bootstrap sample. But then do that many times. So what we do then is, is uh, we do that, um, but add this ensemble step where if we do that, say, 100 times, then we would average the weight across the 100. And our, our um, simulation studies on this say it, it ends up being pretty good in terms of sensitivity and specificity. At the end of the day, then those give you weights that then you can put back in the model for the validation data set, and actually now you just have a generalized linear model, um, and you can test for the significance of the beta one. So that's, um, I've got too many things to do here. Um, okay, so that's it in a nutshell. But the, the newer part of WQS regression is what's called a random subset uh, WQS regression, which you may, may not have heard of. This is the idea of the ensemble step can come from uh, randomly selected subjects, but can also come from randomly selecting variables, right? So suppose you have a, a thousand different variables in an untargeted assay, and you've got 200 subjects. Well, now you've got more components than you've got subjects, but that's okay. So you, you take the thousand components that you have, and you um, say, we use maybe the square root of that. It doesn't matter too much, I think, but a, sm a much smaller number, randomly select those variables, do the analysis, get the weights, and then randomly select another set of variables across all the subjects, right? And then you do that a thousand times and then average across that. So that still gives you a weighted average at the end. So I'm gonna demonstrate to the, you that strategy at the end of the talk today. But because I don't have that, oh, wait, before I get to that. So now here's an analysis strategy, okay? The newer part now also for WQS regression includes the concept of interaction. So when, when, if you think about interaction, remember I said that the covariates, these models are adjusted for covariates. So if you center your covariates, you know, center and scale continuous variables, and, um, and then just think about the reference level for the dummy coded variables for the categorical variables, then at the end of the day, what you have is something you can think about sort of just like that, right? So you've got a beta coefficient with a WQS, you've got a beta coefficient with a my nutrition index, say, and then the potential for an interaction. So the new uh, version of WQS, GWQS, um, allows for the, the estimation of the weights to be in such a model where you have that interaction. I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, what we're interested in testing is in this idea of um, um, nutrition mitigating the effect of environmental exposures is this beta one two, this interaction term, right? Um, but in the WQS though, it's more complicated because we have the beta one two, but we also have implicit in the WQS are those weights. So I'm gonna show you how you can sort of deal with that as well. So there's sort of three models that you can consider. The first one is you might want a response service. I'll show you an example of this in a minute. But this is where the my nutrition index could be a continuous variable and where the WQS at the end of the day is a continuous index. And you can put those in the model together and you get a three-dimensional surface adjusted for the covariates and you can visualize what's happening in these higher dimensions. The older I get, I like to see things. Right? I don't like the complexity. I like to be able to see it. So at least it's an approximation of what's going on, right? Um, Another way you might want to look at it is where you think about the My Nutrition Index as in categories. You might put, um, cut it at um, low and high values. You could also do this for, gen for sex, right? You could say here are the boys and here are the girls. And I want to uh, do an analysis that allows for um, the interaction across, the, across sex. So in this case, we'll be looking at slopes and intercepts for those dummy levels of the um, categorical variable, right? Um, and we can test for the change of slope and a change of intercept um, between those two categories. And then finally, we can do a stratified analysis where we're able to look for, we're uh, able to estimate weights that are different for the different categories. So I'll show you that um, in, in a simulated example. Uh, okay, here we go. So, like I said, I don't have good published 
I mean, data that I can show you that's, you know, um, published already. So I just, I took um, some cohort data um, with permission and simulated data based on it. So this is not real data, but it's closely based to real cohort data. Um, and so I'm looking at birth weight, and I just chose eight um, perfluorinated compounds um, to look at, and then the My Nutrition Index. And we've got covariates there um, that these models are adjusted for. Some are categorical and some are continuous. But uh, I just want to point out that total calories is there. So when My Nutrition Index is in the model, then we're going to do that relative to the number of cal calories that the uh, pregnant woman ate. Um, and then we did the um, GWQSR package. So the coding is there at the bottom um, if you're interested in, in that. It's not too much of a script. I'm a SAS person, but I have colleagues and friends who do the R coding for this in this GWQS package. So again, I want to focus on the fact that these chemical, I mean, sorry, these covariates are uh, either dummy coded, zero or ones for sex, say, or um, they're centered and scaled so that the mean is at zero. So when I do that then, that means I can um, do a model uh, like this. What I'm showing you in the model then is just the, the relationship that has to do with the um, slopes uh, associated with my nutrition index and with the um, WQS for the PFOS chemicals, right? So I'm showing you two different models. One is this interaction model. So I'm estimating the weights in the presence of the interaction. Um, and then here I'm estimating the weights without the interaction term in the model, okay? So the one thing I might want to say is, or look at first of all, is well, do the weights change depending on whether or not the interaction is in the model? And in this case, they really don't change that much. Okay, um, the my nutrition index by WQS interaction is not significant. Okay, that's fine. But look at this three-dimensional surface, and this is again the visualizing thing. I used to do a lot of response surface modeling, and pe some people just cannot see three dimensions. They they flip themselves upside down looking at it. So I don't know if you have trouble seeing that three-dimensional surface, but. Largely, if you think about the My Nutrition Index, in this case, it goes from 0 to 100, but this, for these data, it only went up to 84. But you can see there's an increasing slope there, um, uh, meaning that as, you, as the women eat, ate better for the My Nutrition Index, and at least on the simulation study, the birth weight increased, right, which is good. But not so good for the perfluorinated, the PFOS index here, the um, WQS index, as the exposure increases, you see a decrease in, in birth weight. But we are able to say that the My Nutrition Index is positively significant and the PFOS WQS is negatively significant. So now we've got this thing together in the model, so that's sort of an easy way to, uh, I think it helps in interpreting what's going on. What's the benefit of good nutrition relative to those exposures? Now let's do it though as a categorical. This might be easier to think about, right? So now we've got the same kind of framework, interaction model, additive model. Um, in this case, there is no interaction. So what, I, what do I mean by the categorical? So I took the, I took the um, my nutrition index, split it at the median, so we have low nutrition and high nutrition. There could be three categories, I just did two. There could be more than three, however many you want. Um, but what we see here is that um, when we say that the beta um, is significant related to the dummy variable for, w, for the My Nutrition Index, the binary variable then, the fact that it's significant, that's telling us there's a change of, of intercept, right? The, the meat for the low uh, My Nutrition Index group um, it has a lower birth weight than for the, uh, imp for the higher um, uh, my nutrition index group. So that difference in intercept is significant, right? P value less than 001. We can also see that the PFOS WQS is still negative and, and significant. Um, the fact that there's no interaction is telling you there's no evidence that that slope is different. Okay? That's kind of interesting to think about, right? No mitigating effect there, um, but we do see improvement um, based on the um, my nutrition index as a metric of nutrition. Um, so finally, the, the third thing here, model, is to say, well, what about those, those weights, right? Do we really anticipate that the weights for poor nutrition and good nutrition should be the same? Maybe they're different, okay? So this is a model where simultaneously we can estimate the weights for the categories that we're interested in. Again, keep in your mind, this could also be for, for sex, right? If you're interested in um, differences in boys and girls, this would be a way you could do that really in a nice way. Um, but these are the weights 
it's, I, it's, I know it's hard to see, I'm gonna show you a table in just a minute on this, but um, so again, no significant interaction. Um, so that we don't see evidence that the slopes are different. We still see a positive increase in good nutrition in terms of birth weight. Um, uh, so we say that the intercepts are, are significantly different. The slopes are not significantly different. Um, but here we can adjust, we can look at the adjusted stratified WQS weight, okay? So this is the same histogram that was on the, on the, last, on the last slide. But what we can do with that is, is to tabulate it. And let me see if I can walk you through the table. So the poor nutrition index and the good nutrition index weights there, right? Those, I mean, they don't, I rounded, but they really do sum to one, right? So th that column and that column sum to one. I created now a relative weight category. So, okay, the relative weights are saying, um, given that you're in the poor nutrition group, I'm going to divide that weight by that sum, and that gives me the relative weight for that group. Okay? Now, why am I interested in that? I'm interested to see, have the relative weights changed between the good and the bad, the good and the bad nutrition, right? Interesting, look at this. The P funda had very much similar weight for good and bad nutrition, right? The um, same with PFDA, very similar weights. But look at PFOA, it was double the weight in the poor nutrition group, okay? Maybe that means something, I don't know, but that's something that we can look into. Um, and then on the other side of that, PFHXS was uh, weighted higher in the good nutrition group. I don't know what that means. Again, this is simulated data, but this is the kind of um, thing that you could try to look into and, and um, uh, try to figure it out from that. The thing I want you to think about here, though, is that um, this is just a demonstration of this concept of putting nutrition and um, environmental chemicals together in, a, in the same model, where one's good and one's bad, um, and looking for the mitigating effect of that. Ideally, what I'd like to have is where the WQS is actually the um, random subset WQS, so you could see higher dimensions, not just the eight that I showed you here. So if we had an untargeted assay, and that's what we're working on in the HERE um, consortium, is to put where we have many, many chemicals that we identify from untargeted assays um, in the libraries of these um, different labs that we're working with. Um, so that could easily be several hundred um, components that we would be able to measure. And then we could ask the same, same kind of question. So let me demonstrate to you then, because I don't have good data for that to show you today, I'll demonstrate to you what I mean by this random subset WQS. So this was a study, um, Doug um, Walker gave me these data a couple years ago, um, and he talked about it yesterday. It's this um, trichloroethylene study. So I'm showing you the data as, a, as an illustration of um, random subset WQS. In this scenario that I'm trying to describe for you as a, as a way of maybe looking at some of these higher dimensional things, this would be a health effect, not a, a, a um, concentration of uh, TCE, okay? But the, the method is the same. But in this data then, it was an occupational study um, and they had non-targeted high-resolution metabolomics in plasma on 80 TCE-exposed workers and 95 matched controls. Um, and they did a metabolome-wide association study in their paper. What I'm going to do is a WQS. Um, and instead of just treating it as case control, I don't remember why I did it this way, but I just said, oh, I'm going to take the, um, I'm going to score the TCE as, um, you know, l low, and uh, in the little histogram there, I'm, I'm just cut that at the median, so I had this little scoring thing, zero, one, and two. So, and so this is a uh, spearmint correlations among all of the metabolites, so you can see how correlated they are. They're generally not all that correlated, but there are some that are highly correlated. Um, out of 7,830 metabolites. So in the analysis I did, I, I chose only the metabolites who had a univariate p-value less than 0.3 just to um, get the number, I don't know why, I just did it that way. Um, 2,639 metabolites uh, were left. Um, we deciled each of them for the WQS. Um, again, I split the data between training and, and validation. Um, and the models were adjusted by sex, age, and BMI. Um, and so what I'm after here is the WQS index that has a mixture effect in the positive direction. What does that mean? What I'm trying to show is 
what are the analytes that are most associated with an increase in TCE exposure? Okay, now if this was a health effect, it would be what are the analytes most associated with whatever that health effect is, right? Um, so remember, it's a random subset WQS. So what we're doing is I'm going to do a thousand different models, uh, but where I randomly selected 22 of that 2,600 and whatever the 2,639, I'm going to take random sets of random sets of 22 a thousand times, right? For each of those, I'll get an estimate of the weights, and then at the end of a thousand, I'm going to average across those to get my final index, right? Whoops, I keep pointing at the wrong thing. Okay, so I did that, and on average, the metabolites were included in eight analyses, so we, you know, I did a thousand, but on average, each one was eight. There were a handful that were down to just in, included in one model, so maybe I could increase that thousand to 10,000, okay? Um, and the maximum was 22. So then now the interesting thing about the random subset WQS is that instead of, in comparison to the bootstrap, now the bootstrap option wasn't available here because the number of components is so much larger than the sample size, right? So I couldn't do the bootstrap. But I could look at 22 components at a time in a, in a study of, uh, what did I have? Uh, it's in the previous one. In the valid or in the training set of 80 subjects, right? I could have 22 variables for the different um, component. Um, so at the end of the day, though, uh, we 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 have the each of this was my point. So I lost my mind. Um, the point is that when you take those 22 at a time, what you're doing is actually breaking up correlation patterns, right? So each of those little analyses, it's actually its own little world at that point, right? That's each of those little analyses, we, we've almost seen the decorrelation effect. So right now, this in the GWQS package, this is an option that is going to be available that you can actually go back and forth from if you have the right size um, number of components relative to the sample size. You could look at both of these in side by side and see um, how they compare. What, what is the impact of that decorrelation thing, right? So anyway, so at the end of the day, what we got are 2,639 different weights. Um, and you see the summary statistics here. So remember, these are all these weights all add to one, so they're very small, each of those. The maximum is 0 0.0083, right? Um, so what I said is, well, let, let's just say, what are the number of components there that are bigger than 0 0.002? Okay, that seemed to be an interesting cut point. And that ended up being 66 of them. So the top 66, that was 3% of the total, actually accounted for 25% of the weight. Okay, so this, these things are not equally weighted. There is some more weight on, 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 the, um, on the top ones there. Um, sometimes we do this, and you could say, well, what, how many components would it be to be 80% of the weight? I mean, so you can sort of break this down um, however you like. But the interesting thing is, here's a, a plot. So this is um, TC exposure that's adjusted for the covariates. And we've got this low S where here's the WQS metabolome index that we estimated. And the two different colors are in the two sets, the training and the validation. And they're remarkably on top of each other, right? These are um, significant in the, uh, in the uh, uh, validation data set, okay? So what do the weights look like? So uh, this is just the part of the top 66. But interesting, I just noticed this week, um, I went back to Doug's paper. Um, and the top weighted component um, was actually what he had in a table as identified as trichloroacetic acid. And the fourth one, so th this is the, you know, the um, mass over charge and the retention time coded there for the um, untargeted assay. The WV are my, that's just my stuff, right? But, um, but anyway, that's the trichloroethanol is the fourth one and the first one is the trichloroacetic acid. So that's pretty cool that we're able to pick up in the, just the top handful um, the things that might be what you would consider related to TCE. Now there's a bunch of other stuff in that and that's up to Doug to figure it out, not me. No, I don't know if he's going back to that. But, but the main thing I wanted to demonstrate this for you is just to have you conceptualize the idea of we really can do um, WQS, uh, the random subset version of WQS, as when the number of components is much larger um, than the sample size. So I think that's going to be really cool for um, 
untargeted assays, and we're going to be doing a bunch of that. We have been doing a bunch of those in the CHEER data center and now the HERE data center. Um, those data are not available to show yet because, you know, it's, it's not, they're not published yet. Um, and, but once they are published, then those things will be uh, publicly available um, in the repository for the, um, for the data center. Okay, so in summary, um, I think of the Nutrition Index as a metric of dietary nu nutritiousness, given the total calories. Um, I'm hoping that we can use these kinds of um, indices in, in more studies. Um, uh, I, the new G GWQS permits the uh, capability of looking at interesting interaction models and things, so I'm really excited about this new version of WQS that's available now in GWQS. Um, and so I like the idea of having the, the, can we actually look at nutrition as a concept that we can look at in terms of how it's, uh, you know, is it significant? Can you see the impact of it on important health outcomes? Um, and again, the, the final analysis there of TCE was meant to just demonstrate the generalized, I mean the um, random subset WQS and, and thereby um, make you sort of think about, well, maybe you could do an analysis with nutrition and an untargeted assay for exposures. So a team is what we need, and so I have a really good set of a team in, at uh, Mount Sinai, and um, so we have Paul Curtin and uh, Stefano Renzetti uh, are related, are worked really hard on this GWQSR package. Um, and then we have a group of uh, people in the data center for the uh, HEAR and CHEER that uh, meet almost weekly uh, looking at metabolomics analyses. And um, Doug Walker's a valued um, colleague and uh, uh, we got the TCE data from him from last year. So um, I appreciate uh, your attention and I'm um, pleased to answer questions if, uh, if I can. Thank you very much.